Good morning and welcome to our virtual service here at Sunny Hills Church of Christ. We miss you all and can't wait to see you soon, but until then you can join us every Sunday at 10 a.m. for our service premieres on Facebook and YouTube where you can comment and chat with other people who are watching as well. Some announcements for this week. We are doing our prayer week starting tomorrow, Monday, May 4th, where we will be posting and emailing prompts that we could all join in together at 12 p.m. every single day in preparation for the National Day of Prayer on Thursday, May 7th. We hope that you'll take these prompts and join in at 12 p.m. every single day to pray together as one voice. Also, our devotionals will still be posted Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays on all of our social media outlets, as well as our website, um, www.shcoc.org. This week, our study halls are continuing on Mondays and Fridays at 3 p.m. So any elementary, junior high, or high school student is invited to join in, get help with homework, and be motivated to do it all together. Don't forget that on Sundays, our children's Bible videos will also be posted for children's and families to enjoy together. They're awesome videos done very well that teach and grow our kids even while social distancing. We are also wanting to remind you that giving is available online on our website at www.shcoc.org or through your banks through using bill pay, or you could just drop off anything at our church um, during the week, Mondays through Friday. We thank you so much for joining us today and we hope you enjoy the service. We love you all and we'll see you soon. Bye. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lead on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigned. Unending love, amazing grace. He is jealous for me, loves like
like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy when all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so yeah he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves and we are his portion and he is our prize drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes if grace is an ocean we're all sinking so heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss and my heart turns violently inside of my chest i don't have time to maintain these regrets when i think about the way and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so yeah he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves sing it again yeah he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves good morning sunny hills good morning james and carol here and we're happy to lead communion service this morning um, something that's been on my mind a lot is the book of Isaiah and how Isaiah uh, how Isaiah prophesies the coming of the Messiah and what really blows my mind is that in chapter 53 Isaiah he talks about the suffering servant and he describes Christ um, very very well and very specifically um, in Isaiah uh, 53 7 he says he was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers so he did not open his mouth he's talking about Jesus what's amazing about this to me is that this is about 740 years before Christ was even born and I think that our Lord realized, you know, through a lot of patience and trials with his people in Israel, with Zion, um, who basically were the community of Christians uh, for, the, for the whole world, 
for Christians, for people that were to accept Christ and be part of the Christian community globally, that he knew we needed a Messiah. And he knew that he had tried with his people to, to he gave them the promised land and he gave them um, health and he gave them food and he did many things to, to try to help them but they continued to slip up. You know, they engaged in idol worship and there, there was a lot of sexual immorality um, over and over again uh, through the generations and there was uh, drunkenness and idolatry and just a lot of things that, um, that God you know, told them and tells us not to do. But he knew they needed a Messiah, so he brought Jesus. And what is um, so interesting to me is that Isaiah describes Jesus so well and um, lays the lays the groundwork for Jesus to come. And, and you could have you could have looked at this and said, "Wow, you know, he knew Jesus. He he was with him and and he saw him. And this was you know real time a real time description of who Christ was. But it wasn't. It was it was all part of God's plan." 740 years before Christ arrived. So at this time, as we remember Christ um, and we take the bread, um, I'd like to give thanks for God's plan. I'd like to give thanks for his prophets and for God recognizing that we needed help, that his global Christian family needed a Messiah and needed a plan to be saved. So I'm going to take the bread down. Thank you, Father, for, for this bread. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us a way to be part of your body forever. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. When, when Jesus held the Last Supper, as described in, in Matthew, in the book of Matthew, and he, he brought his disciples together, um, he instituted the Lord's Supper that we're partaking of now. And he said in Matthew 26, 28, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now, from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You know, it's hard, it's hard for me to understand the full context of Christ's plan, God's plan for him. And it's hard for me to understand his suffering and his, uh, the willingness that God had to sacrifice his son, especially after all of the things that he had seen mankind do. But he loves us. And although I sin over and over again, and many people sin over and over again and, and need forgiveness, um, God knew that we needed a vehicle. He knew we needed a mechanism to be part of his family and to remember and to stay connected. And this is how, this is how we do it. This is how we stay connected to the family of God. This is how we stay connected to Zion. This is how we stay connected to Israel of the past. And this is how we stay connected to the present. And, and this is how we'll stay connected to Christ and to God in the future. So as we as we stay connected, let's drink the wine, let's take the cup, and, and let's remember um, the great sacrifice that the Lord made when, um, when he allowed Jesus to be crucified so that we may be forgiven. Lord, thank you so much for, for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. 
Thank you for your love. Thank you for forgiving us over and over again. And I ask that you bless this cup. I ask that you would uh, forgive us, Lord, and, and I thank you for forgiving us. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Sunny Hills, thank you so much. We're really looking forward to being with you again. We're really looking forward to that physical connection, interface, touching, hugging, you know, being with you again. Um, it's, uh, it's time, and we're looking forward to having a normal church life again. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Good morning, Sunny Hills Church, and everyone who's visiting us from Facebook and YouTube, Instagram, the website, or wherever... Uh, you may be coming from to join us for this uh, video and uh, and church service. We're glad you're here. We hope you'll be blessed by the the singing and the communion and the the lesson today. <clears throat> Seems like in a time like this, a, a time of of unprecedented crisis, uh, it's really a time to to draw near to God. Uh, James says, "Draw near to God; He will draw near to you." And somebody said, "When life knocks you to your knees." It's a good time to pray. Not just pray, I mean, and we should be praying more and more, um, but, but finding time to spend with God, uh, finding time to read the word, maybe sitting out in the garden or out by a tree, getting some sunlight, appreciating the, the sun that's out now. Um, just finding time for meditation, reflection, time for silence, time to just spend with God. And then listen, listen to, to God's loving voice and his leading and his promises of assurance. Um, this is really important right now. And, um, but for a lot of people, it's very difficult to draw near to God. It, you, you may be finding a hard time uh, finding yourself safe in the arms of Jesus or or uh, walking with him alone in the garden, uh, because there, there may seem to be a wall that keeps you from getting uh, really close to God, from drawing near. And uh, so I want to talk about that today, because th there's, there's, there's something that creates a wall, and uh, it has to do with our focus again. Last week we focused, we looked at what happens when our focus is on sin, and, uh, and we don't understand that Jesus has dealt with sin, so we focus on sin and we end up uh, judging others and condemning others and then condemning ourselves because our focus is on sin. And, uh, and there's another problem, and it, it's a, a focus on performance that, that ends up cutting two ways. I mean, it's the same issue, but uh, causes us to, to not be able to draw near to God. It, it creates like a barrier to the grace of God. Paul says in Ephesians, it's for by grace you're saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. Uh, but it's the gift of God so that nobody would boast. Um, if there's any work going on, it's, it's that we are God's workmanship. It's what God is doing in us. And so, so it's not of works. It's not of our performance. And when we focus on performance, we create a barrier to the grace of God. We're not able to experience and, 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 uh, and be moved and lifted by the power of his grace because our focus on performance, it, it just creates a wall. And uh, just a couple of examples of that. When I was uh, in Lancaster years ago, I did a Bible study at a coffee shop called Hanging Java, and it was with bikers. And they actually patched me as their uh, preacher, and they were called the Writers of the Cross. And uh, so we had a Bible study there for a while, and... Uh, and they were great people. I loved them. They started coming to our Lancaster church for a while. Um, but while I was there, there was a, a guy one time that came in and, and some people were coming to me and complaining that he was from a church that had a similar name to our church. And, but yet he was saying things that basically were, was telling everybody that, that nobody was you know, saved. Nobody was uh, Christian unless they went to his church. So I went over and talked to him. And I, I just said, hey, you know, tell me, tell me how to be saved. I, I just want to know the gospel that you're preaching. I want to know about how to be saved. And, and so he, I listened to the whole thing and uh, things I've heard before. 
And uh, when he was done, I simply asked him, are you saved? And it set him back. He, he stammered for a little bit. And finally, he, he said he applied what he was saying to others to himself. And he said, well, if I, you know, do these things, if I'm, you know, don't do those things, if I have these doctrines or. And so he, he started going down this road. And, and when he finished, I said, OK, but. But are you saved? Like right now, if Jesus were to come and the parousia, the, the revealing, the trumpet sound, the blast, and he arrived right now, are you saved? Right now, do you have that confidence? And he started to do the well ifs, uh, if eyes again. And and I said, I said, friend, if you don't know that you're saved, then you don't have a gospel to tell anybody else. Uh, John says in, in 1 John 5.13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. In John 5, 24, I think it is, he says, we who believe in him have eternal life. We've crossed over from death to life and we won't be condemned. We have this confidence, but he, but he didn't have it. And, uh, and so he couldn't preach it. He couldn't give a gospel. He couldn't give any good news. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, he was focused on performance. But, but that knife cuts two ways. So, so, so he didn't understand the grace of God. He, he had a bunch of rules and a bunch of uh, doctrines that people had to believe and pro procedures they had to follow, but, but he had no idea of the grace of God. He, so he couldn't feel forgiveness. He couldn't feel God's grace and experience his burden lifted. He just had a bunch of rules. But there's another way that knife cuts, and, uh, and it was in many people's lives. I, I can think of one sister... Uh, who was in the hospital for a triple bypass and uh, facing death. And there was a brother who was dying of cancer who I talked with over the course of weeks who kept telling me, Randy, I don't know if I've done enough. I don't know if I know enough. I don't know if I've been good enough. And, and same thing that with Sister Jones and, and really others uh, over the years who, who have struggled with having confidence in their salvation. And, and it always seems to be based in this, I don't know if I'm good enough thing. I don't know if I've done enough. I don't know if I know enough. And so I remember telling this, this brother, uh, Gene, I remember saying, man, that's just good common Christian sense. You, you're right. You don't know enough. You aren't good enough. You haven't done enough. Um, and I tried to preach to him this gospel, the gospel of salvation by grace through faith. And, um, but that's what it does. When we're focused on performance, it puts up a barrier. It, it's like a heads or tails. You, you can choose heads or tails. You can't choose both. The coin will either land on heads or tails. And if heads is God's grace, being saved by grace through faith, and tails is an evaluation of your performance, you, you, you can't choose both. If you're focused on performance, there's no way to experience the grace of God. And so you effectively put up a wall. And so I actually titled this sermon, uh, um, Not Guilty, by association. We, we understand the concept of guilty by association. Um, it's like uh, if you've seen the movies where uh, the family, their daughter wants to date the boy uh, across the tracks and the, the parents say, you know, you can't date that kid from across the tracks. They're all, they're all criminals and, and, and troublemakers over there. Uh, and, and the boy she likes may be a perfectly decent guy, but, but he's guilty by association. Um, or after 9-11, a lot of people who were uh, who looked Middle Eastern or who were Muslims uh, were, you know, complaining that people were looking at them suspiciously all the time and, and they were being treated differently as though they were, you know, terrorists and, and they were guilty by association. So, so we understand this, this uh, concept, guilty by association. But we don't really have a phrase for the other way like in a good way like not guilty by association but but blessed by association or saved by association or rescued by association delivered by association we don't have this and so uh and so the best i could do for a title was guilty by association but not guilty by association uh, or guilty by association but in a good way um <laughs> So I wanted to look at some Bible stories that show this principle because maybe we're not familiar that this is a major principle in the scripture. 
Um, and so uh, in the story of uh, Abraham and Lot, in the story of Lot, um, we see this principle several times. Uh, so when Abraham is called to leave the land of his, of his father, he's in Haran, and he's called to leave to go to the promised land, his nephew Lot, it says, it went with him. And, um, and it, Lot was not part of Abraham's family. Uh, some people try to make a case for that, but, but he just wasn't. He, he traveled around as a separate family, a separate clan. There was Abraham's clan and Lot's clan, and wherever Abraham went, Lot went with him. He, he traveled around. And the thing is, God promised Abraham blessings. If Abraham would go and trust him, he would bless him. And he did that, and Abraham was growing in wealth and cattle and lands and, and everything, and crops and whatever, and he, he was gaining this great wealth over time, and, and, and so was Lot and his family. He, he was gaining all that as well, but he was never promised it. He, he was just becoming wealthy and blessed because of his association with Abraham. Not for any promise made to him, but just because he was associated with Abraham. And so, and so he was blessed by association. Um, and then uh, he was so blessed that their, their, their two clans couldn't stay together. They had to split and change, you know, uh, lot, one of them had to move away because the land couldn't hold both families. They were just uh, growing too big uh, in, in terms of uh, cattle and crops and, and blessings. And so Lot and his family moved down in the cities of the plain area. Well, the next story comes that, that uh, some kings and some forces come in and conquer the area and take off, take away all of the, the people of the cities of the plain. And with them, they take Lot and his family. And so Abraham gathers together some fighting men and he goes and he conquers those kings and delivers Lot and his family. But not only Lot and his family. Everybody, all the people of those cities, they got rescued, they got saved, they got delivered because they were with Lot. They were associated with Lot. Abraham just went there to save his nephew Lot and his family, but he saved all of those people and they were all brought back. And so they were all delivered because of their association with Lot. And then even another story in that is that um, when it was time for Lot and his family to leave that area, uh, because it's going to be destroyed. Well, just before that, uh, Abraham, uh, God makes it known to Abraham that he's going to destroy these cities because of their wickedness. People, even visitors would just go visit the city and, and they'd be taken out of the city square and raped at night. And, and you know, there was just violence and evil there. And so uh, Abraham's told that God's going to destroy the city. And so he starts sort of questioning God, like God, Will you really sweep away the righteous with the wicked? In, in other words, Abraham was saying, God, are, are these righteous ones going to be guilty by association? And the answer is no. God doesn't work that way. They will not be guilty by association. In fact, God says, if there's 50 righteous people, I'll save the whole lot of them. All, the, all of the seven cities and all their people will be saved if there are just 50 righteous people that they're associated with. And so there's that other principle. They, they are not guilty by association. They're going to be saved because of their association. And then, well, what if there's not 50? What if there's 45? And Abraham starts to bargain with God because what if there's only 10 he gets down to? And then God says, for the sake of 10, even for the sake of 10, I won't destroy it. In other words, if there was just 10 righteous people in all those cities, all the cities would be saved and not destroyed. They would be safe from being destroyed just because of their association with 10 righteous people in the city. And so, no, God's not going to hold people uh, uh, guilty by association. He is willing to allow a whole bunch of people to be saved by association, though. But they're not, because there's not 10 to be found. But, but Lot, Lot and his two daughters end up, that's all, they end up being saved. And the text says, because God remembered Abraham, Lot and his daughters end up being saved for Abraham's sake. And so uh, saved by association, uh, not destroyed because of association, not guilty by association, all of these kinds of principles. So all of that is in the story of Lot. There's another one in Joshua uh, chapter 6 about, um, excuse me. It's the story of, of Rahab. 
Now, who knows Rahab's profession? You do, right? <coughs> Rahab is a prostitute. And, and what did Rahab do in order to be saved from the destruction that was coming upon Jericho? Well, we know what she did, right? She, she hid the spies, the Israelite spies that had come to spy out the area. She hid them and uh, kept them safe. But think about how she did it. She, she hid them on the roof under some branches, and when the police came, she lied to the police. She said, well, I think they went that way. I mean, I don't know where they are. Yeah, she does. But, but I think they went that way toward the city gate. If you hurry, you might catch them. They may be already be out the gate. That's what she told them. But she knew they were on the roof. So she lied. So here we have a lying prostitute. If we want to understand the grace of God, we need to know this story. Here we have a lying prostitute who is saved from the destruction that's coming on Jericho. Not because of her behavior. It's not a, it's not a, nobody's focused on her behavior in this story, but there's a focus on her faith. The fact that she believed in the God of Israel, that he would deliver, that he was going to deliver Jericho into the hands of his people. And so, and so because of her faith, she was saved. But not only her. If you read the story, not only her. She was saved. Her mom, her dad, her brothers and sisters, her cousins, her aunts, her uncles, her nephews, her nieces, grandparents, everybody that belonged to her, if there was any servants, all the people that belonged to her were saved by association. They didn't show an act of faith. They weren't the ones who hid the spies. They, they didn't do anything to deserve that, but they were saved by association. That's a principle. Uh, in 1 Peter... There's another Old Testament story that 1 Peter uses, and this is the one that really has to do with us. Peter uses this to say our situation is like that. When we think of our salvation, we are we're not guilty by association. We're, we're going to be saved by association. We're going to be rescued, delivered, preserved, saved, not guilty by association. And, that's what he's going to get across here. And so in, in 1 Peter 3, he talks about how in verse 19, how 18, how Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Jesus went through, Paul says, that God made him who had no sin to be sin, so that we might become his righteousness. Jesus suffered death for us, so that we could be saved so that we could be not guilty by association. We are guilty. We are guilty, but we're being counted as though we're not guilty because of our association with him. Just like those people across the tracks, even if they were really good, they were counted as not good by those parents of the daughter who wanted to date them. You get that? We are considered not guilty by association. And that's what he wants to get across here. And so after talking about that, he brings up the story of Noah. And that's when he says, God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Now think about this. I want to talk about those eight people for a moment. What's significant about the fact that there's eight people in there? Well, eight's not really one of those big biblical numbers. Uh, but, but all eight are not the same in the boat. They're not the same. There's a difference. One of them is different. Out of the eight people that were saved in that ark, one was different than the other seven. One was different than the other seven. Only Noah was said to have found favor with God in a world full of uh, violence, uh, where all men's thoughts were only evil all the time. That's how it's described in Genesis 6. Only Noah is said to have found grace, found favor in the eyes of God. Just Noah. Not, not any of the other seven. doesn't say that anything about them being found, uh, receiving God's favor. Secondly, only Noah is called righteous. He was a righteous man in that kind of a wicked world. Only Noah is called righteous. Not the other seven. Not his wife. Not his three sons. Not their wives. None of them 
None of them are called righteous. None of them are said to have found favor in the eyes of God. None of them. You have Noah and the other seven. And one more thing. Noah is called righteous. <laughs> no, <laughs> Noah is called righteous. Noah is called favor. I uh, found the favor. Noah is the one, the third thing. Noah is the only one who built the ark. At least that's what the Bible says. The Bible only says Noah built an ark. It never says, like we may have assumed and we may draw, you know, children's stories and have everybody working together on the ark. Who knows whether that happened or not? But the Bible doesn't say that happened. Noah is the only one said to have built the ark. And that becomes important when we understand the story of Noah as a type of the story of Christ. Noah was righteous. He found favor. He built an ark that saved the other seven. Now, this number seven is significant. Number seven is the number for completeness, for perfection. And so the complete number of people, seven, were saved in an ark that was built by one man who was declared to be righteous and who found favor in the eyes of God. That's a story Peter is pulling forward into our story. He says, that is just like what happened to you and me. That's what he's saying. He wants us to think about our salvation just like that. Now, what do we associate with? Are we the Noah figure? Of course not. Noah is the Christ figure. He, that's a shadow, a type of Christ. And so, so, so Noah is the Christ figure. Who are we? We're the rest of the family. We're the rest of the family saved, not because we were found favor, not because we were found righteous, not because we built an ark, but we're saved because of our association with the one who is the ark. He built the ark and he is the ark in which we are saved. Paul tells Titus, he says in chapter three, he saved us, not because of righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Peter says right here, he goes on to say, In it, uh, eight persons were brought safely through death, water. And then he says, baptism, which corresponds to this. He says, our baptism is, is a picture of that. What happened there happens in our baptism. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What he's saying is, listen, as long as we're thinking about performance, we have no good conscience. We don't. Uh, if we're honest with ourselves, we're going to be left with a bunch of ifs. Or we're just going to know that we can't be good enough for God. The only way to have a good conscience is to be saved in Jesus. The same way Noah's family was saved. Because they were his family. That's the only thing we know about them. The only thing we know about Noah's family is that they were his family. The same way Rahab's family was saved because of Rahab. The same, same way Lot was saved because of Abraham. The same way all the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were saved because of Lot and his relationship with Abraham. We are saved in Jesus. Paul says, by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. We are in Jesus. He is the ark in which God saves us. And we're saved because we place our faith in him. The, the, the way the baptism is associated is, in baptism we identify with the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ. In Romans 6, Paul says, or don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death and risen with him through our faith in the operation of God. I think I just confused uh, Romans 6 with Colossians 2, but... Uh, let me try again. We were buried with him through baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. That's the way Romans 6 says it. And so, and so because we put our faith in him, because we identify with his death and resurrection and baptism, we, we find ourselves by faith in an ark 
saved from the destruction that's coming upon this world. And we're in that ark because we are his family. We are his mother and his brothers and his sisters. Like he said, when his mom and his, and his family came to take him because they thought he was nuts. And he said, who are my mother and brothers? So it's, it's those who, who believe in me. And so, and so our, our place in Christ is secured because we are his family. We are saved by grace through faith. And this is a gift of God. And once we approach God this way, it breaks down that barrier of, of performance because we know we're not good enough. Paul said of himself, I am the worst of sinners. He didn't say I used to be. He wasn't evaluating what used to be. He says, I am the worst of sinners. But he also says in another place when he's ready to die, but now a crown of life has been prepared for me. Paul had full assurance of faith, although he knew it wasn't because of his performance. And so my, my prayer is that we can take our eyes, stop fixing them on sin, stop fixing them on performance, and start fixing them on the grace of God that forgives, that fills us with his spirit, that lifts us out of that place of condemnation and gives us a new hope that bears in us his fruit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Uh, that approaching God in this way will have peace. And when we have that peace, we'll be able to find him in, in dark times, in troubled times, in difficult times like this in our nation and in our world. And so I pray that, that you will find that, that closeness with God, that you'll draw near to him so that he can draw near to you through this time. May God richly bless you um, today and, and every day until we can be back together again uh, um, in our services. Um, God bless. Bye-bye.